Hi, this is Tom McGrath, editor of Philadelphia Magazine, and welcome to the final session of Philadelphia Magazine's ThinkFest. Our conversation this afternoon is about the future of tourism and retail in Philadelphia, with Lauren Gilchrist of real estate firm JLL, as well as Angela Val of the PHL CVB. They'll be interviewed by Philadelphia Magazine Deputy Editor Sarah Zlotnick. We've had some great conversations this week, and I want to thank all of our participants and guests, and I want to thank you for tuning in. And I'd like to say one final thank you to our sponsors, Bank of America, St. Joseph's University, T-Zero Group, and Paperboy Media Group. If you've missed any of the conversations, please go to phillymag.com thinkfest, and you can find all the videos there. Thanks again for tuning in. Enjoy this final conversation. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Philly Mag's Think Fest. I am so thrilled to be here today. My name is Sarah Zlotnick, and I am a deputy editor here with Philadelphia Magazine. And today we will be talking about the future of tourism and retail in the city of Philadelphia. And I am extremely excited to be joined by two very wonderful women today to discuss this topic. Um, they are Angela Val and Lauren Gilchrist. Lauren is a senior vice president and senior director of research for JLL in Philadelphia. Her specialties include urban and regional economics and demography. And Angela is the chief administration officer of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau, where she is responsible for government and external affairs, as well as managing the day-to-day -day operations of the PHL CVP. Oh, that's an acronym. Sometimes it's a little bit of trouble with that one. Um, but again, this will be a very, very fun conversation. We are here to talk about, I mean, a fun conversation, but a very serious one. We are here to talk about the future of tourism and retail in Philadelphia. And we, of course, can't do that with talking about what's going on in Philadelphia right now. Very serious things that are going on in Philadelphia right now. Um, recent protests continue to highlight how inequality and systemic racism pervades all major institutions and is woven into the very fabric of our city, um, into the very way that our commercial districts are laid out um, and the way and kind of the boundaries and the barriers that exist um, to be able to do business in the city. So Lauren and Angela, I wanted to touch on that both with you in the wake of these protests. Like what are the issues that we need to know about um, that prevent our city from evolving? Sure, so I, I can take a stab first. I'm not sure you want to go to for Sarah or? Lauren, that would be great if you wanted to kick it off. Sure, I'll, I'll do my best. So first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And thanks for kind of kicking off the conversation with a question that I think is very important that we address as a business community and as a civic community. So thank you for, you know, giving us the opportunity to talk about it in this forum. Um, you know, I think what's been really interesting to watch over the course of the pandemic and the last couple of weeks in Philadelphia is the way in which we see a lot of the inequity in our city, in our region, in our society, manifests itself in some of what we saw transpire over the last several weeks. So in a lot of ways, the sector that was most disproportionately hit by the impacts of the pandemic, first and foremost, was the retail sector, whether that be, you know, apparel goods or restaurants or really any other kind of small to medium sized business that required um, a shopper or an individual to be able to enter an establishment to be able to conduct business with um, that business. So retail in a lot of ways has been, I think, disproportionately impacted by that because we can't congregate together. Um, and then secondarily, when we look at kind of the protest activity over the last couple of weeks, you know, really the, the anger and frustration and the civic unrest in a lot of ways manifested itself as um, you know, destruction of storefronts, destruction of retail. And, you know, in a lot of ways, retail and, you know, the corridors through which some of that protest activity occurred um, is really kind of the true um, central heart from a geographic perspective in Philadelphia, the business heart of Philadelphia, and also the retail heart of Philadelphia. And I think it really is a profound statement, you know, to see that that's where a lot of this activity occurred and that's where a lot of the damage occurred. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier and what 
I think is kind of notable about the the retail environment is in a lot of ways, it was very reflective of white businesses or businesses catering to white individuals in Philadelphia along our high street corridors, um, especially as we've seen rents rise, particularly along the high street corridors of Walnut and Chestnut. And we've seen, you know, an influx of very high price point retail in Philadelphia. So I think it's it's notable and not accidental, you know, that a lot of these types of activities have been occurring in those particular areas. So what, what I think in terms of the future is really interesting to start thinking about. And I, I think Angela's got a lot of, you know, statistics and data on this is, you know, what does the future of retail look like if it is diverse and if it's inclusive? And one of the things I think that's actually a barrier to diversity and inclusivity in the retail environment is simply the high cost of doing business in Philadelphia. So we have one of the most onerous tax structures of any city in the country, And recently in some of the budget proposals that have been discussed in council and continue to be discussed in council, they're discussing, you know, increasing the burden on businesses and increasing the burden on workers in Philadelphia, um, especially those that come into the city from outside the city in the form of an increasing wage taxes. So I think in terms of policy, it'll be, you know, I think a really big question in terms of how can we meet our city's basic needs for services and additional services? How can we create diverse and inclusive environments and retail environments? And how can we help not just um, black businesses, but businesses of all stripes to survive? Because some of these are fundamentally economic questions. Absolutely. And Angela, I know that Lauren mentioned that you have some stats you wanted to share. Would you be willing to share those with us? I would. I would. I I first want to say thank you for having the discussion and including tourism. Tourism and retail are very closely related as many of our visitors, whether you're here for a meeting or just here for a leisure visit, um, enjoy shopping here um, in our region and in Philadelphia. Um, At the PHL CBB, we take our culture and heritage very seriously. And we are taking a step back and looking at all of our materials to ensure that we're telling Philadelphia's story through many lenses, Uh, not just the colonial story that we all know, but also the story of African Americans who have shaped so much of Philadelphia's history and color and culture. We are also drawing upon the uh, BIPOC talent in the city to help us amplify messages that don't usually make it to the front page um, or at the top of the list of Uh, visitor attractions and um, amplifying their backgrounds and their perspective is also going to be something that we incorporate more moving forward in our marketing uh, to visitors. I think what set Philly apart from other destinations is our people. And if we don't give them a microphone to tell their story, then we're doing a disservice uh, to our visitors. Uh, Philadelphia was also one of uh, the first CVBs in the country to have a uh, diversity division, PHL diversity, uh, they are solely focused on diversity and on ensuring that all communities in Philadelphia benefit from the economic um, impact of tourism. Um, we have about a 60 person advisory board that works closely with us to ensure that we are producing programs and reaching diverse businesses. Um, and giving them the opportunity to benefit for some of these large meetings and conventions that come in. Um, it would be wonderful to have more black owned businesses to promote in Philadelphia. But sadly, uh, according to Pew Charitable Trust, only 2.5% of Philadelphia's small businesses are black owned. Um, that's an anemic number when 42% of Philadelphians are black. Uh, I think there must be a real effort to help start and grow black owned businesses here in our city. Um, Blacks are approved for financing at a much uh, lower amount usually and at a much higher interest rate. Uh, The wealth gap also contributes to uh, financing um, challenges for black owned businesses and making it harder for them to secure financing. Um, 42% of black owned businesses use cash from FINS uh, and family to fund their startup versus 32% of white businesses. Um, That number um, is something that I think correlates with what uh, Lauren was saying earlier. It is very expensive now to do business here and grow your business in uh, Philadelphia. 
Uh, I think if we're really serious about growing black businesses um, in our city, then we should incentivize building owners to help black businesses occupy ground floor spaces in a high traffic area such as Rittenhouse and Chestnut Street. Often black businesses, they encouraged to open up in a neighborhood that rings center city, um, which might not be the same type of foot traffic and only make them a destination location. Um, building owners have a say in who leases space from them. So I think they need to be a part of that process um, and commit to uh, getting on board with something, with a program that could really focus on growing uh, Black businesses. And the last thing I really want to say about it is Black businesses have a tendency to, and any minority businesses, hire people that look just like them. Minority businesses are great for the entire community because they support a part of our community, minority workers, that are most highly affected by unemployment. Um, so I think growing those businesses can help us in many ways, um, not just with uh, helping uh, minority communities um, gain more wealth and independence, but also contributing to Philadelphia's economy. Lauren, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, just to, to briefly touch on, you know, Angela's point that landlords do get to choose, you know, who occupies space in their building. You know, one of the challenges to all the systemic financial questions that Angela raised, I think that it's important to note from the real estate side is that credit really impacts a landlord's perception of the desirability of the tenant because their outcome is to ensure the longest term lease at the highest rate possible. And the way that they ensure that is by examining a, 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 a tenant's credit. So, you know, when you get down to the fact that, you know, we've got an, un, you know, not predominantly, but a partially unbanked population that open businesses with cash that don't have a history, it gets really challenging. Um, and I think requires some creative thinking if, you know, we want to incentivize that type of activity. Absolutely. Those are amazing insights from both of you. Um, one of the most powerful voices in this conversation, I think, is the consumer. It's the person that comes, either comes to Philadelphia or is in Philadelphia and is choosing where to spend their dollars. And I think that consumer is powerful both in the economic impact that they make with where they spend their dollar, but also just as a citizen of Philadelphia, as a voting citizen of Philadelphia. And I want to ask you both, and Angela, perhaps we can start with you. What suggestions do you have for consumers and citizens who are one and the same most often how can they use their dollar to make an impact and how can they use their voting, um, their voting voice, their voice in general to make an impact um, on the very things that you discussed and you mentioned? I think one, you know, you have to really make that decision that you are going to dig just a little bit deeper to find out if a business is black owned so that you are able to find them go visit them, eat in their restaurants, drink at their bars, or buy something from a retail shop. It is not something that's just clearly advertised, but the same way uh, consumers have been conscious about supporting businesses that have a social give back, that same kind of consciousness translates into finding and supporting minority run businesses. And you have to make that extra step because you're not going to find them necessarily in your commercial corridors. And one of the things that most minority businesses don't have is the money it takes to market your business on some of our typical channels, on social channels, take out advertising, do branded events, that type of thing. I think when it comes to voting, you have to pay attention and you have to show up. I mean, going and supporting folks that have an agenda that would support a minority community in a meaningful way is important. And when they don't mention that, it is up to us when all of these politicians have these public events and forums where you can ask questions to bring it to their attention so that it will rise to a level of a platform. Um, you can see just what's been going on over the last two weeks, what happens when people, the average citizen, makes their voice heard and keeps their foot on the back of somebody's neck. Absolutely. Um, Lauren, do you have any perspective to add to that? 
Yeah. So one of, I think, the great gifts of COVID-19, if there can be any, um, is that it's really forced us to slow down as a society and to stop and to think and to be a little bit more intentional with everything that we do. Um, We talked a little bit recently, Sarah, about the way that e-commerce has really changed consumer behavior patterns. And we've seen a lot of centralization of purchasing decisions um, up to a couple of, you know, brand name giants around the country, right? And in a lot of ways, that's fueled, I think, by consumer laziness or consumer lack of time. Um, You know, when I think about my shopping patterns online, a lot of it's convenience driven because I can point and click and have something at my door in a couple of days, as opposed to doing what Angela's describing, which is a far better way to ensure that dollars that are generated in the Philadelphia community stay in the Philadelphia community by spending at locally owned businesses businesses. You know, we've gotten really lazy. We haven't done our research. We need immediate gratification. We can't wait to, you know, for Saturday to go shop in our commercial corridors. We've got to be able to point and click and have something at our doorstep in 48 hours. And so it's been interesting to watch ways in which consumers who might not previously have shopped online are doing so out of necessity and how that you know, behavior pattern is changing. But also, I think because we've seen the protest movements happening, we have seen also people getting sick. I think because we've all been home and bored, I think we've been reevaluating some of our purpose and some of the way in which we approach how we vote with our dollars. And so to Angela's point, you know, I think it's really important for the vitality of Philadelphia's retail community, especially Black businesses within the retail community, for Philadelphians to be voting with their dollars in the retail you know, establishments that we have in our city to ensure their survival, but also to ensure the growth of the city. And I think we've become really complacent in sending those dollars to other communities, sending those dollars to big businesses. And we need to think about the type of environment that we want to have on our doorsteps when we walk outside, because it's important not just to the business community, but also literally the health and fabric of the city. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm curious, I'm listening to you both there. Um, just got me thinking about other ways that people can have an impact. And I don't know the answer to this question, so I'll be curious to hear what you say. Um, But I also think about all of the high rises and the apartment buildings that go up in the city, um, people moving in as tenants, as condo owners. Is there any way that we can use our voices as like property owners um, in a building that might have commercial retail on the bottom to voice our preferences and advocate for businesses that might not uh, otherwise be able to like get a foot in the door in these high traffic areas. Is there anything that we can do there as like citizens of Philadelphia? Um, Lauren, is that something you might be able to speak to? So I'll try. I don't know that I have a perfect answer for you, but you know, what we've seen in our high street commercial corridors over the last call it five to eight years is rapidly rising retail rents that have begun to be tamped down by some of the structural changes that we're seeing in retail overall. So if you've walked Walnut and Chestnut, even before the pandemic began, you started to see some of the traditional, particularly apparel retailers, high-end apparel retailers, start to go out of business, start to close their doors um, because the rent had gotten so high and the consumer demand wasn't there because consumers would rather, or in some cases, prefer to shop online as opposed to going into the physical store. So What the pandemic in some ways is going to, I think, accelerate is some of the falling rents um, that we would expect from a structural shift um, towards e-commerce that already began. So this is really, in a lot of ways, one of the best opportunities for small business owners or for minority business owners to kind of get their foot in the door because, candidly, the rent has just been too high. Um, And, you know, for a for-profit landlord, which we need their capital, we need their investment, we need their um, social investment in Philadelphia, you know, they still have that motive to kind of raise those rents as high as possible to cover their debt service, to cover their pro forma modeled expenses. I mean, real estate is a real business, which I think consumers forget sometimes. But that being said, this structural shift I think will actually create a virtuous cycle for the actual tenant, whereby they'll have more leverage in some lease negotiations in certain cases, which could open up doors for additional diverse businesses in the city. That's fantastic insight. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
Angela, I wanted to move on to another way that we bring in money and that we bring in jobs into this city, which is conventions. Philly works hard and loves its conventions. It's a big, <laughs> big wonderful thing for us. Um, the pandemic has undoubtedly altered the way we think about large gatherings. Yeah. How does Philadelphia need to reimagine this sector uh, going forward? Yeah. Yeah, it's big business here in, in Philadelphia. And despite uh, the stay-at-home order and the travel bans, it's clear uh, people still want to travel and meet in person. Um, you know, being there in person matters, and there's a power in gathering and experiencing something together. It's something that cannot happen over a video screen or a monitor or your phone, but being there together at a concert or seeing the ocean for the first time or shaking the hand of the person that is your best client, um, those things are important. And because of that, I do believe that the travel and industry will uh, bounce back. Might be a slower bounce back, but we will come back. Uh, right now, we're ensuring meeting attendees uh, must feel confident that they have a safe and healthy experience from the moment they arrive until they depart. Every touch point in between must be perceived and is clean and safe and sanitary. That is, you know, whether you arrive by cab or Uber, where you stay in the hotel, what restaurants you go to, uh, what attractions you see, public transportation, all of those points are a priority in a clean and safe message. Um, our, first, uh, our first step really is to get ourselves together and ready to host conventions in this new environment. Uh, this crisis has definitely shown one thing, that the meeting industry needs to expand its toolkit and start innovating. Um, our team is working with many of our partners, such as the Convention Center, Visit Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Airport, Visitor Center, and all of our hotels to come up with our clean and safe um, and healthy plan. Um, through our PHL Life Sciences Division, we have an amazing connection to a lot of public health and medical and pharma companies. Um, we are leveraging these connections uh, to have and create a small group, uh, the PHL Health Task Force, which will be about 15 experts who will help us stay on top of best practices and also help us support our 800 members that service conventions. And these are folks like flower shops and transportation companies, printing companies, um, restaurants and bars. Um, we also know that we have to make our spaces more healthy. Um, we are not the only destination um, going through this, but we are definitely the only destination so far um, that has a task force of 15 to help them uh, create their plan. Um, the structure of meetings and large events are going to change, at least um, for the next year or two, most likely. Um, you'll certainly see a lot of changes when it comes to uh, complying with social distancing, food service, the day of the buffet is over. Um, virtual gatherings will be combined with in-person gatherings. Um, you will see a lot more hybrid events um, that depend on technology. Um, there will also be increased cleaning and sanitizing, mandatory um, temperature checks, um, sanitizer and uh, washing stations, probably everywhere. Um, floor plans will also change quite a bit. Wider aisles, reduced capacity, um, different types of floor plans that would allow people um, to social distance. Um, so it's going to feel a lot less different um, when it comes to perhaps a museum in the sense that they might be just reverting to time tickets um, that would allow folks to come in to meet their new capacities. But you'll still be able to see all the beautiful paintings and art. Um, concerts, not really sure yet um, how concerts and sporting events are going to uh, be addressed at this point. We've looked at everything from um, keeping some seats empty, limiting the capacity for each show. Um, but as Lauren was saying for retail, that also impacts um, how much uh, revenue can be gained from these shows and what that looks like when they have to pay their own overhead for their, for their buildings. Um, it's gonna take some time, um, but we believe that the travel business will come back and that people will um, adapt to what these new rules are. Absolutely. And 
this is a conversation that no one likes to have, but as you mentioned, like the economic impact of not being able to fill our venues to capacity is a very real one. Um, what do we need to be thinking about as a city? Like, what do we need to be bracing ourselves for um, in the in light of that? Well, I, I think, you know, what you're starting to see now are what businesses won't be opening back up. Mm -hmm. And you're starting to see what's going to be the, uh, you know, new footprint or business model um, for some of the other uh, attractions. The theaters are going to most likely be dark this summer. So I think as you see what businesses are not going to be able to reopen those businesses who, even though we might be in a yellow or green phase and they have the opportunity to open, they cannot uh, because there's uh, still so much to consider in regards to how to make a new business model work that would allow for them to hire back staff as well as pay overhead. Um, you will see that oftentimes in hotels um, without business on the books, it's very hard to open up to 100% capacity. So I think it's going to be a much slower uh, kind of comeback and roll out um, until the traveler starts to feel more comfortable getting back in a plane um, and traveling again. Uh, the economic impact of that is still really unknown right now. And But I, what I can tell you is that of March 1st, we had lost over 340 events. Mm -hmm. uh, those events would have brought in 317,000 attendees wow. and generated 410 room nights. As a region, as a Philadelphia region, Philly and the four, four surrounding counties, um, we are at a loss as of May of 1.8 billion. Wow. And many of our hotels um, and attractions and restaurants are either still um, in a space where they're suspended business or they have very, very limited business hours um, and capacity. Um, additionally, I want to just touch on the fact that we bring in international travelers as well. And they were, um, were really projecting a decline of about 35%. And that is after four consecutive years of increased visitation numbers. Um, we are probably going to um, have international travelers come back last where you will see probably the first visitors to put their toe in the water would be a drive market um, around Philadelphia. And then slowly people will get back on planes. Businesses will feel comfortable sending their staffs to meetings. Um, but international, they were the first to decline and they will be most likely the last to come back um, at this point. Those are very real numbers that you just shared. Um, yeah, it's a lot to think about. Lauren, I want to extend a very similar or excuse me, question to you. Um, how do our retail institutions need to reimagine what they're doing, and how what is the what do you see being the economic impact of that um, in order to ensure that customers feel like their health is being taken seriously? Well, Sarah, as we spoke a little bit about, you know, it's really very early to tell in the real estate market overall. Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of trickle down or domino type effects that can occur. Um, when we looked at our, you know, pr uh, property management portfolio nationally for JLL for uh, office space, we were upwards of 85% of collections in call it April and May um, when we looked at tenants that were paying rent. We're seeing a lot of landlords and tenants working together to forego rent for a period of time, oftentimes tacking on rent at the end of the term for a period of you know three months abatement in the current environment. On the retail side, collections were a lot more grim. They were somewhere more in the 25 to 30% range across the portfolio of projects that we managed. So those are the sobering numbers when you think about the fact that those rent dollars go to not just the landlord's operating expenses of the building. They go not just, you know, lining the pockets of the landlord, which people think that's where all the money goes, but most of these buildings have significant amounts of debt on them as well. So not collecting rents also puts banks at risk, but banks have become very adept at working through these processes. Um, so we're not at a breaking point just yet with these numbers, you know, not to mention that in an urban environment, retail is often a component of a larger building. 
Um, how is it going to change the retail environment? I think in a lot of ways, the crisis is accelerating some structural change that we already saw happening. So I touched on the idea of e-commerce. E-commerce, despite how much it impacts us, is really still a very small proportion of overall consumer spend. It has increased significantly during the pandemic, and we've got new cohorts of people more comfortable than ever with shopping online or some kind of hybrid model where you click your groceries online and then you go and you pick them up at the store itself. So this has been a really great experiment in a lot of ways for what the uptake could be for e-commerce overall. Um, so that being said, what we saw even before the pandemic was this shift to omni-channel retail. Mm -hmm. And so by that, I mean, you know, a brand would have um, an in-person brick and mortar space, also some type of online presence. Maybe you could click and pick up at the store. Maybe you would try on in the store and you would have something ordered and shipped to your home. I think that COVID will definitely accelerate the shift to omni-channel, and I think it will be interesting to see what it does in terms of overall store footprint. It feels like right now, you know, consumer big box day-to-day um, -day goods like you would find at a Target or at a large grocer seems to be here to stay in some fashion, though we might see that shift. But we're going to see, I think, a lot of change continue in some of the more hard goods um, and what we would see as typical high street retail. Yeah, understood. That all makes sense. Um, Angela, something I was thinking about while you were speaking earlier, um, hospitality, for a story that I was working on last year, hospitality was the second fastest growing industry in our city. Like we take a lot of pride in like bringing people in, um, making ourselves an exciting destination and like really providing for them while we are here. Do you think, and I think we've really worked hard to create that identity for ourselves. Um, do you think Philly is gonna have to reimagine its identity in the wake of all of this? Mm, not completely. Great. I think there's definitely going to be change that happens. Um, with every crisis comes opportunity, and with that um, definitely comes change. And what I do think what will happen is people right now in this crisis have a much better understanding how big the hospitality industry he is here in Philadelphia and how many businesses it impacts. Um, just as you said you know, before, um, it is something, uh, an industry that we have focused on that has helped uh, Philadelphia's community. Many of the jobs that are generated here um, are in our hotels and in the service industry. You don't necessarily need a college degree to get those jobs, but they are family sustaining wages that are paid along with providing uh, health insurance um, for their family. And I think that's very important and because we have such a large population um, that is, um, you know, has economic challenges, I think that it is always going to be hospitality and tourism and industry that is focused on here um, in this region. Um, tourism has also helped put Philadelphia more on the map and on the international stage. Um, so I think those things have also helped um, other industries here and for Philadelphia's reputation, um, investment, and being able to attract other talent. So if anything changes, I think there'll be uh, more of a focus on what we do and how that we maintain the momentum that Philadelphia was experienced before the COVID-19. Got it. Um, there is a specific event coming up um, in a couple of years. It is the 250th anniversary of the United States of America. It is the, and I'm going to try to pronounce this, the semi-quincentennial. Uh, got it. Right. <laughs> um, this is a really big deal for Philly. Like Philly like takes a lot of pride in its role in American history. Um, it fought hard to host very significant events um, for this big celebration. And I know we have big plans for it. And I know with it, we plan to bring in and we've hoped to bring in a lot of tourism dollars. However, I think in the light of everything that's happening right now, um, a shift in what are the American stories that we need to tell and celebrate is absolutely necessary. Angela, how, how do you think we need to shift um, the stories that we tell and what we celebrate um, in 2026 um, in accordance with what's being brought to light right now? Yeah, sure. 
Um, at the CVB, we're really focused on bringing major events uh, that will help secure Philadelphia's role um, as a centerpiece for the 2026 celebration. Um, we've already secured um, 2026 Major League Baseball All-Star Game, and we're actively working to secure World Cup matches. Um, these will be nearly back-to-back -back events in, uh, the, uh, in July, um, and they would provide Philadelphia an opportunity to be on the national and global stage. Um, but at the same time, we really must take advantage of the highest degree um, to ensure that true diverse um, stories are amplified um, in the celebration. Um, we have to be honest with our history. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and understand that is the country's history, not just African-American history or history of immigrants. We have to tell everyone's history. And uh, I think for us moving forward, making an effort during the planning stage to include other voices um, would help ensure what that celebration will look like. It should also not just concentrate on our history, but also what our future looks like. Um, and I hope really in that celebration, um, also having all these other events and the world's eyes on us that we do really take an opportunity to step back, look at where we've come and um, really focus on where we want to go. Absolutely, yeah. Lauren, do you think that there's anything just like planning ahead and looking forward that keeping that in mind, but also keeping in mind everything that we've discussed um, during this conversation that retail can continue to do? Like, how can retail be sure that, it, like, their their hiring practices are fair and just? Like, how can, how can retail look ahead and look forward to ensure that when we are, when the spotlight is all on us in 2026, like, that we're proud of the stories that we're telling and the improvements that we've made? I think the first thing that I would say, I think that we need to lower the barriers to entry to doing business in Philadelphia across the board, not just for retailers, but also for, you know, traditional businesses um, when it comes to the expense of operating in Philadelphia. We all love Philadelphia and we all want it to be successful and we all want to make sure that services are provided for. But I think if nothing else, this moment and what we're seeing going on in city council right now is a real rallying cry for right sizing some of the expenditure items or looking at where we might be able to be more efficient in the dollars that we spend that are public. So that would be the first thing that I would say. The, the second thing that I would say is I think that we need to get creative when it comes to the retail environment and the way in which retail interacts with the landlord community. So I mentioned that there might be some opportunities whereby rents might not remain at this, you know, ultra high level in Philadelphia. Um, and I think that we need to think about retail as being accretive to the value of the building overall and not, you know, necessarily the, you know, means to an end of profitability in a building. So retail impacts the way that we experience the street, the way that we experience life in Philadelphia, the way that we experience visiting Philadelphia in a way that um, residential doesn't and in a way that office doesn't because it's not visible in the public domain. Retail is fundamentally part of the public domain. And we believe very strongly that the right types of retailers in an office building, for example, can actually help the landlord to perform better on the office rents and the office occupancy because they have the right amenities on the first floor. Um, same thing with our high street retail. You know, all of those retail spaces are associated with some type of residential building. And I think it's going to require a structural shift in the way that we as a real estate community community in urban areas, think about the value of retail and not just tie it to the rental rate dollars. And so when I think about, you know, what this looks like going forward for the next 50 years, I think about retail as, you know, shifting in the investment community's perspective um, to something that is actually valuable to the building, valuable to the community and valuable to the city overall. The lesson I'm really taking away here is that so many different facets of the city um, that are both outward facing and internally facing all need to work together to make these changes. I think that we're seeing that consistently across the board, but the insights that y'all have shared certainly drove that home for me. Angela, Lauren, I cannot thank you enough for being here and for participating in this conversation with me. Um, this has certainly been eye-opening for me, and I hope that it's eye-opening for everyone that watches. Um, thank you so much to you both. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you.